Now we're going to talk about memory. PCs have quite a bit of memory of different kinds. Let's take a look at some general concepts that will help us to understand what we're talking about when we say memory. One of the things we expect our PCs to do is store information. This information can be our data files, it can be our application software or our operating system. If this information were not stored in the PC itself, we would have to reinstall it every time we turned on the PC, and then it would have to be stored or kept somewhere while it was being used as well. So right here we can see that there are two kinds of storage, short-term or temporary storage, and long-term or permanent. Permanent storage is the kind where the information will be accessible the next time we turn on the PC. That is, the information does not disappear when the power is off. Permanent storage is more properly known as secondary storage. The kinds of devices that are secondary storage devices are those that maintain data when the power is off. Hard drives, optical disks, flash memory disks, and so on. Temporary storage, on the other hand, is where data, applications, or programs reside while the system is using them. This kind of storage is called primary storage. RAM is primary storage. Information in primary storage is volatile, which means it is lost when the power is off. Now it's important to remember that your processor can only access something that is in primary storage. Your processor has no direct connection with secondary storage devices. If it needs to work with a particular piece of data, that data must be moved from secondary storage, such as your hard drive, into primary storage, like your RAM. Therefore, the more RAM a PC has, the more information can be readily available to the processor and the faster the data can be processed. PCs have a great deal of secondary storage and much less primary storage. Secondary storage is where all information is kept on a permanent basis until deleted, and primary storage only holds information being used by the processor. Main memory, or DRAM, is where most of the data and instructions that are being used by the processor are kept until needed. DRAM holds its contents in capacitors. Now this technology is inexpensive, which makes it feasible to have quite a bit of main memory in your system very cost effectively. Now the disadvantage to DRAM is that the capacitors hold this information for only a very short period of time. In order for the contents to be maintained then, the data must be refreshed or rewritten and this happens many times per second. The information is RAM, in RAM is stored in rows and columns much like a spreadsheet. The processor doesn't know exactly where in RAM the data is stored. The memory controller chip, though, does know, and when the processor sends a request for information over the address bus, the M MC locates the correct information and puts it on the front side bus to go to the CPU. DRAM chips have not changed much over time. In early PCs, DRAM was found on the motherboard in groups of individual socketed chips. The potential for upgrading was not very easy, so this was quickly superseded by putting these memory chips on small cards or silicone strips which plug directly into slots on the motherboard. The first strips were called SIMs, or single inline memory modules. These strips had 30 pins or connecting places along the bottom edge and were known as 32-pin SIMs. 
Then came the 72-pin sims, which may be still found in some older working systems, such as the earlier Pentiums. Sims all have a 32-bit data path. Next came DIMM technologies, or dual inline memory modules. Like Sims, DIMMs have pins along the bottom edge, but the pins on one side of the strip are counted separately from those on the other side. Early DIMMs were SDRAM, or Synchronous Dynamic RAM strips with 168 pins. This memory is rated by the system bus speed, and it operates in sync with the system clock. So the speed of the RAM needed to match or exceed the speed of the front side bus. These modules could hold anywhere from 8 megabytes to 2 gigabytes of RAM. The data path on SDRAM is 64 bits wide. RIM technology consists of Rambus DRAM. 184 pin RDRAM modules are physically incompatible with SDRAM. RIM modules must be mounted into RIM slots on the motherboard. They cannot be used on motherboards that support DIMMs. Also, each socket must be filled on a rim slot motherboard. If the slot does not contain a rim strip, then it must have a placeholder module known as a crim or continuity rim. These have no memory modules on them. They're just there to make sure that the data flows from the rims to the front side bus. Now this is licensed technology and manufacturers had to pay a fee to use Rambus rims on a motherboard. Most manufacturers were reluctant to do this, so this technology has become another legacy technology or has become mainly obsolete. DDR SDRAM or double data rate SDRAM runs twice as fast as regular SDRAM by processing data twice on every clock beat. These strips have 184 pins but are the same size as SDRAM, so to tell them apart they're notched differently along the bottom of the strip. They can hold up to 2 gigabytes of memory. The data path is also 64 bits wide. DDR2 SDRAM is faster than DDR, uses less power, and comes on a 240-pin DIMM with a 64-bit data path. It clock doubles the input-output circuits on the chips and has special buffers that let DDR2 run much faster than regular DDR3. DDR3 SDRAM was until very recently the most recent um, upgrade for SDRAM, specifically for the support of dual and quad-core processor systems. Now, DDR3 supports front-side bus speeds of 800 MHz to 1600 MHz. The data path, again, is 64 bits wide. These sticks also have 240 pins, but they are keyed or notched differently than DDR2 sticks and can't be used on motherboards with DDR2 RAM slots. Because of several changes in the technology and architecture of DDR3, some of this RAM is easily overclocked. These strips also use higher density memory chips, which means more RAM capacity in a single strip. Now, you may also be aware that just recently we have started to see DDR4 SDRAM. Again, faster than DDR3, physically incompatible with DDR3 slots. SDRAM is also used for laptop memory in the form of SODIMs, or small outline DIMMs. DDR SODIMs are either 200 or 140 pin micro DIMMs. DDR2 has 200 pins, and these SODIMs are incompatible with regular DDR. DDR3 SODIMs have 204 pins, so that you can't put those in a single slot. In a, I'm sorry, in a DDR2 slot. 
when we're counting RAM, all RAM counts are in units of 1,024 bytes. So 1 megabyte is 1,024 kilobytes, 32 megabytes is 32,764 uh, kilobytes, and so on. Round to the closest even number that is a multiple of 8, as RAM amounts range anywhere from 16, 32, 64, 128, to 256, 512, to 1024, or 1 gigabyte, uh, 2 gigabytes, 4, 8, 16, and so on. Now, you may come across a system that will count the first 640K of RAM separately as system or conventional memory. Now, the reason for this had to do with how DOS-based operating systems and the processors that worked with them actually see system memory. This conventional memory is included in the total RAM amount for your system. When you're installing RAM, sometimes you can add just one strip, and sometimes you must add pairs. To determine which to do, here are some of the guidelines. When we're talking about single channel RAM, if a system has a 32-bit system bus, like a pre-Pentium system did, it had to receive 32 bits of memory data at a time from the RAM. A 72-pin SIM has a 32-bit data, thus on a 486 machine you can take and install one SIM at a time. That provided enough information to fill up the front side bus and make the system happy. If a system had a 64-bit system bus, like PCs beginning with Pentiums did, it had to receive 64 bits of information at a time. Since that 72-pin SIM had a 32-bit data path, you must have two SIMs to provide 64 bits of data to fill up the front side bus. And that is why, in the early Pentiums, SIMs were installed in pairs. That was a rule. When we talk about DIMMs today, the situation is different. DIMMs have a 64-bit data path, so only one DIMM is required to fill a bank on a system that has a 64-bit frontside bus. In fact, there are what's called double-sided DIMMs that has 64 bits worth on one side of the strip and a second 64-bit or a second bank's worth on the other side. So a single strip like this could fill two memory banks in one slot. Don't see that very often. Don't really need to worry about it, but it's just something to be aware of. As far as where to put RAM strips, memory banks are generally numbered beginning with zero. Many systems want you to populate or fill bank zero first and then continue in order as you install more RAM. Many other systems don't care what slots or banks you put the RAM in. If the system doesn't work when you install the RAM, move it to another slot and try again. Now, when you're working with dual channel RAM, the system's memory controller communicates with two DIMMs at the same time. This basically doubles the speed at which the system accesses the memory. Motherboards that support dual channeling might call one channel A and the second channel B. Motherboards that support um, these channels will have two slots of the same color, and the second channel's slots will be a different color. When you're filling a channel on the dual channel system, you must have two identical sticks of RAM for each slot. They must be the same amount, the same speed, and the same features. Ideally, they will be from the same manufacturer. And in fact, if you're shopping for dual channel RAM today, they come in pairs. You don't have to go out and look for two single identical strips. You just look for the dual channel that comes two strips to a package. 
if you want to fill channel B as well, that RAM does not have to match the RAM that's in channel A because each channel has its own 64-bit memory bus pathway. What comes in from channel A is independent of what comes in with channel B. If the two slots of a channel are not populated, or in other words, there's only one strip in the channel, the motherboard will automatically revert to single channel memory processing. Some motherboard chipsets that work with DDR3 RAM also support triple channel memory, where three sticks of RAM are needed to fill a bank. Just pay attention to whether you're working on a system where one, two or three slots make up that bank and always populate that bank fully as well as if you intend to use single or dual channel uh, processing. Now when you're going out to buy memory there are some things you want to keep in mind. Poor quality chips can cause frequent GPFs or general protection faults. These errors will cause the system to hang or disrupt your processing application work. So sometimes the cheap bargain uh, type of RAM is not the best deal. Latency. You may see references to CAS latency or RAS latency. These are ways of measuring speed, referring to the number of clock cycles that it takes to read or write either a column or a roll of data from a memory module. Generally, it takes two or three clock cycles to read or write data. CAS latency values are given more often, and lower numbers are better. So CL2 is going to be faster RAM than CL3. When you see a series of numbers separated by hyphens, as in 55515, the first number is your CAS latency, and the second number is your RAS latency. Memory speed. This is indicated in DDR RAM by the PC rating. This is a measure of the total bandwidth of data moving between the RAM and the processor. For instance, if you have a DDR DIMM running at 266 megahertz, it has a data path of 64 bits or 8 bytes. Remember, 8 bits in a byte? So the transfer rate is 8 bytes times 266 megahertz, which equals 2,128 megabytes per second. We generally round this to the nearest 100 value, so DDR266 has a rating of PC2100. Since today's RAM is 64 bits or 8 bit 8 bytes wide, all megahertz values will be divided by 8. So common PC ratings are things like PC1600, which is 200 megahertz, PC2100, and so on. This information is also found in the table in the memory chapter of your book. So if you're uh, looking for, for RAM, you might see it referred to by the PC rating these days. Remember that each motherboard has a maximum amount of RAM that it can access and use. If you put in more RAM than the system can access, it will actually slow down your system and cause problems. So check your system documentation or go online to the manufacturer to see how much and what kind of RAM is required for your particular system. Also, each operating system has a maximum amount of RAM it can work with. You can find this information for your version of Windows on Microsoft's website. Installing RAM is pretty simple. All RAM is very sensitive to static electricity, or ESD, so wear your wrist strap and properly ground yourself to unpainted metal when you're working with RAM. Leave the strip in its protective packaging until you are ready to install it and put any working memory or RAM that you remove into an anti-static bag or package. 
make sure the power to your system is off and unplug the power cord. Remember that today's systems still have power to the motherboard when they're plugged in, even if the power is not turned on. You could cause a short if you touch something else in your case while you're installing the RAM. DIMMs and RIMs insert into their slots much the same way that expansion cards do. Line them up properly, push them straight down into the slot until they click into place and the side tab brackets come up to hold them. You should not have to pull those side tab brackets up yourself. They will come up automatically if the RAM is far enough down into the slot. So if they're not coming up, push a little more firmly on the edges of the RAM and try to get it more firmly further down into the slot. To remove the RAM, press down on those side tab brackets and those strips should pop up from the slot and then be easily removed. Now if you do encounter a system that has SIMs, these cannot be installed straight down into the slot you will destroy the slot if you try to do so. Rather, you lay the strip into the slot at a 45 degree angle from the motherboard so that the pins make contact with the slot and then you push the strip upright so it's perpendicular to the motherboard. They should catch properly behind the latches at the side of the slot. To remove SIMs, release the latches first and the strip will, should then fall to a 45 degree position where you can lift it out. Now the reason that I mention SIMs is because removing and installing memory in most laptops is quite similar to the process for installing and removing SIMs. First, you must make sure to unplug the AC power and remove the battery from the laptop. Otherwise, that motherboard is live and you run into the same kinds of problems. Locate the memory, which is usually, although not always, under a panel on the bottom of the laptop or sometimes found under the keyboard. It will be laying flat against the circuit board. Release the metal catches at each end and the strip will pop up to about 45 degrees from the motherboard. Then gently lift it out. Reverse the process to install a strip. Insert the strip into the slot at a 45 degree angle, then gently press down until the sides catch behind the latches. Today, RAM strips also contain a chip known as the Serial Presence Detect or SPD chip. This chip stores information about the RAM on this strip, the size or amount, the speed, if it's error correcting or not, if it's registered or not, and more. When your system boots, it looks at this chip and lets the motherboard's memory controller chip know this information so that it knows what it has to work with. Several utility programs can query this chip, as shown in Figure 7.36 in your textbook. One of the things that POST tests for when you boot a PC is the presence and the amount of RAM. If you've installed RAM, you should notice that your system counts up to the new amount. If it does not count the new or additional memory, the RAM is not installed properly. If the system does not boot at all and nothing shows on the screen, the RAM is either not installed properly or is defective. To test installed RAM, you can use the memory test that's listed there. Or in some of today's systems, um, as the system boots, you can uh, press a particular key and it will take you into an area where you can actually test the RAM and its integrity. And that concludes today's discussion of RAM.